watching online, um, just praise God, knowing, just picturing you lowering your head, praying with us. Um, technology is a blessing. I'm glad that we're able to even have the, the online as well. So look, we're going to dive into the word now. Um, if you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We're in John chapter two, in John chapter two. Today, we're going to be looking at Jesus turning water into wine. Not grape juice, but real wine. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to just let the word explain the word, right? That's the beautiful thing. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, right? So let's go to John chapter 2. We are journeying verse by verse through uh, the book of John. If you're just joining us. If you have missed the messages, but you'd like to catch up and you're deciding, hey, I do want to journey through John uh, with Antioch, you can download our free app, um, whether Android or iPhone, you can download our app, Antioch Christian Fellowship, free app. And then if you go right to recent teachings, um, it'll just say John 2022, and you can see the last five messages we did. Uh, John chapter one, so meaty that, yeah, we, we, we had five or six messages just on John chapter one, uh, and we've all come away changed from that. So uh, are we all ready? We ready? Okay. Uh, well, let's pray one more again, all right, and let's dive in. Lord God, it's not the quantity of prayer, but the quality of prayer. We believe that because you say it. Would you settle our hearts? And as we get into your word, may your word get into us. We give you the right to have free course in our hearts and minds, rearrange, enlighten, convict, bring what needs to be brought so that we will look more like you at the end of this hour than we did an hour ago. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we're in John. Who is John? John is one of the 12 apostles. Who is John? John is an uneducated fisherman who is conquered by the love of Christ. Who is John? John was one that we'll read of in Luke's gospel account who came to Jesus with a lot of baggage. Anybody relate to that? Anyone come to Jesus with a lot of baggage? Or you came to Jesus with just like, you know, like a little lunch box full of baggage? Or did you come with baggage, right? Just close your eyes for a minute and picture the amount of baggage that came. Did you need bell hops? Was it, was it like, did you need wheels? It's just so much baggage. John was such a one. John was bigoted, had prejudices, had a fiery disposition, we see that in Luke's gospel when Jesus and the 12 are heading to Jerusalem, but the Samaritans, Samaritans were half-breed Jews. They were half-Jew, half-Assyrian. They had a different religion than the Jews and had a lot of weird stuff mixed in with it. Samaritans did not like Jews. Jews did not like Samaritans. They were like lions and hyenas. And as Jesus is heading through Samaria to go to Jerusalem, because Samaritans believed you worshiped in Mount Gerizim. So it was almost like picture border control, if you will, or a toll booth. It's like, oh, you know, oh, Rabbi Jesus, okay, whatever your name is. Oh, and your 12 disciples. Okay, oh, you want to pass through Samaria. Oh, oh, where are you going? Oh, oh, you're going to Jerusalem to worship? No, 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 you can't cut through here. You got to walk all the way around. And with Israel being about the size of the state of New Jersey, that'd be like telling someone they had to walk around Trenton. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to walk around. Imagine you wanting to walk through Trenton and you're already walking and someone says, no, you got to walk around Trenton. You can't come through here. Well, John didn't dig that. So John says to Jesus, why don't you call down fire and incinerate all of the Samaritans the same way Elijah did with those false prophets? And Jesus says, hey, you don't know what spirit you're of, meaning that's not the Holy Spirit, that's another spirit. And his nickname actually became Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. But isn't it amazing that John, just like us, comes with his baggage, his bigotry, obviously, the prejudice, the fiery disposition, and he gets so conquered by Jesus' love that he becomes the apostle of love. 
He's the one that when you read 1 John, which is right before the book of Revelation, it's all about love. He's the one that said, how can you even tell me you love the God who you can't see if you can't even love the person in front of you who you do see? That very person was transformed. And we love hearing about that because it gives us hope in knowing that God, who is no respecter of persons, is doing the same work in us, transforming us. Whatever you see is the biggest personality flaw or just that one thing, all is okay until that one thing about you flares up that is just so not Jesus. And it just seems to so show up whenever it wants or whenever you're triggered. Remember John. He is the apostle of love. So... The Holy Spirit uses this man, and we spent time in this, but I, I get excited about it. When you hear me repeat stuff, it's just because, don't you go to restaurants and order the same dish over and over? Don't you go to coffee shops and order the same coffee, right? Why? Because you dig it. There's some stuff that I'm just digging heavy about John. I mean, I'm loving the fact that in my research, found that Plato, one of the greatest minds known in modern history, right? Oh, yeah, I guess you call it ancient modern history. Let's call it recorded history. Plato, in his musing, said, the invisible deity, how can we know him? I wish hope that one day the deity, that's all he could refer to him as, the deity would give us a logos. He uses this Greek word, would give us a logos. And logos means expression. An expression, something tangible, so that from the invisible, we could have a visible expression to know God. And then look at this, an uneducated, bigoted, prejudiced fisherman gets converted, rocked by God, surrenders to the Holy Spirit, and then he's the one who writes the answer to what the learned Plato, the equivalent of what Cambridge and Oxford and all the greatest minds were musing at, God uses an uneducated fisherman to write, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and with that him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And then he says, and John 1, 14, and the Logos, the word, word in the Greek is Logos, and the Logos, the very thing Plato was just wishing upon a star for, the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So as we are reading, and today we're going to read of Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine, it is the answer of what the Platos and the Socrates were just hoping. God came down in human flesh and walked among us and revealed. He came as the expression. He came as the heart. If you saw him, you saw the heart of the invisible God. If you saw his style, you saw the style of the invisible God. He came and walked among us. Does it still excite you to talk about this, or is the incarnation something we should only focus on December 25th? Never mind that Jesus wasn't even born December 25th, but we observe it. Why? Because we observe it, and it's a great time to just celebrate and get family together and then be able to share the gospel with the world. You know, people always want to run up, well, you know he wasn't born on the 25th, like we're just supposed to burn our Bibles. Well, the Bible doesn't even say he was born on December 25th. Oh, you know it was the winter solstice. Yeah, we all know it's the winter solstice, but it's just when we take an opportunity to celebrate it, you know, and eat some good food, right? So here we are, right? We, last week right? Looked at how a church is established, how a church grows, and how a church extends. We see John the Baptist pointing at Jesus. It begins with the preacher pointing at Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. We then see Andrew beholding Jesus and runs and gets his brother Peter. And we talked about how that is the injunction upon all of us to bring family to Christ, bring family to church. It didn't say that Andrew went and gave an eight-point sermon, you know, to Peter. He just said, come and see. All you got to say to your relatives, to your friends, come and see. Oh, I, I've been to church. Oh, I ain't been to church in 20 years. Why should I go to your church? You know what I think about church, right? Come and see. That's all he said in John 1. And then we see people bringing friends. We see Philip go and get Nathaniel. And in John chapter 1, what does Nathaniel say? We looked at this last week. He says, what can come good out of Nazareth? He said, 
We, we found the Messiah, Nathaniel. His name's Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, what can come good out of Nazareth? Nazareth was a ghetto. And our Lord chose to come down and to have the name of a ghetto on his title. Could have been Caesar's Rose Garden. Could have been the Hebraic University of Jerusalem. Chooses to come down to the ghetto and be from the ghetto. So anyway, Jesus meets this Nathaniel who thinks nothing can good from the ghetto, come good from the ghetto. And he says to Nathaniel, if it's blown your mind that I saw you under the fig tree, if it's blown your mind that I already am showing that I know things about you that no one else knows, look at what he says in verse 51 of John chapter 1. He says unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, after this, you're going to see heaven open. Would you underline heaven open? You're going to see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, mind you, Jesus is not talking to a Gentile. He's not talking to a Greek philosopher. Jesus knows who he's talking to. He's talking to a Jewish man that knows his history. So when Jesus says, you think that me showing that I know your innermost thoughts blows you away? you're going to see something even greater. You're going to see heaven open, and you're going to see angels ascending and descending on me. Now, we might read that and say, oh, okay. But if you've attended here long enough where we teach the word, you know the story of Jacob. Nathaniel knows the story of Jacob. Remember Jacob, who was a swindler, blasphemed God, lied to his family, stole the blessing from his brother, right? Has to go on the run because his brother wants to kill him. In Genesis 28... Write this in your notes. If God can justify a Jacob, he could justify anyone. If any of you have a hard time accepting the fact that the Lord can love you and really tell you that there's no record of your sin and you really have a clean slate, if there's anyone here wrestling with really believing that, maybe you could believe it for others, but you're still wrestling with believing that for you, study Jacob's life. Matter of fact, if you go to our church app, Antioch Christian Fellowship, and if you go to character studies, Listen to the message I did called Jacob the Hustler. If God can justify a Jacob, he'll justify anyone. Jacob is a blasphemer. He's on the run. He stole the blessing of God from his own brother. And when he's laid out in the middle of the desert using a rock for a pillow, when he's at his worst, not even looking for God, he's just looking for the next hustle and just what his next plan's going to be. What happens in Genesis 28? He has a dream. And in the dream, he sees a ladder with heaven open, God at the top, and angels going up and down the ladder. That represents God's angels as ministering spirits and guardian angels to take care of us. Yes, the Bible teaches we all have guardian angels. Did you know that? Did you guys know that? Okay. What now Jesus is saying to Nathaniel is, you're going to see more than just my omniscience. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on me. The same heart that knows everything about you, Nathaniel. Insert your name. You're going to see angels carry blessings. When you think of angels going up and down Jacob's ladder, that is up to heaven, down with orders. Up to heaven, down with orders. That is blessings. He says, you are going to see blessings coming in your life, Nathaniel, based on who I am and who my heart is. I am Jacob's ladder. I am the connection between heaven and heaven's power and a dark world with no power. Jesus is Jacob's ladder. You should fall in love with that, right? I know Hollywood took the name and made it into some horror movie, right? Always taking some names we should love in the Bible, done, made it a horror movie. Now you bring it up, you think about some bogus horror movie or whatever, right? Jesus is Jacob's ladder, right? So now in John 2, when we see Jesus turn water into wine, it, there's no chapter break when this was written. John is writing it, so it goes right from him saying, you're about to see heaven opened, and now we're going to see what heaven opened looks like. Now, Jesus performed countless miracles. John's gospel records just seven of them. But we're going to go to what we're told here is Jesus' first miracle. Do you know Jesus turning water into wine was his first miracle he ever did? 
First miracle he ever did was turning water into wine. Not because we think so, not because it's just a tradition to say it. The Bible tells us that was his first miracle. Wow. Of all the things that he's going to do, he's going to heal lepers. He's going to raise the dead. He's going to cast demons out of people, rebuke the storm, feed hungry people. The first miracle he chooses to do is turn water into wine. And he could have chosen to do it anywhere. Could have turned water into wine outside the temple. Could have turned water into wine. The story of the good Samaritan who was half beaten for dead and had to have wine poured in his wounds as an antiseptic. Could have turned water into wine there, right? But where does he choose to perform the miracle? At a wedding. So the first miracle is him turning water into wine and he chooses to do it at a wedding. And this is where we see in John's gospel, the first manifestation of heaven being open. Do you still get excited at the thought that heaven is open on your behalf? That you, because you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, because you've entered into a covenant agreement with God, you provided the sinner, he provided the Savior, you received his love gift, and you've now become his son or his daughter, do you understand that heaven is open for you? Do you understand that Jacob's ladder, the connection is there? Think of so much of your life where it felt like God was a million miles away and many adopt agnosticism because they say, because I feel like he's millions of miles away, you can't know him. Therefore, he's unknowable. Therefore, I'm an agnostic because in Latin, a or ab means without. Gnosis means knowledge. Without knowledge, he can't be known, right? But because we've now made him Lord and Savior, that veil is gone. That wall is gone. That wall is built by our disrespect and our sin of God. But we've accepted that Christ died on the cross for us to knock that wall down, to restore us. And the actual word when it talks about having peace with God is actually the Greek word. It's the idea of taking two strands and braiding them together. So just as when a lady braids her hair, it's literally one. It's two strands of hair and they're braided and become one. We don't just have peace with God. We are now one with God. And now heaven is opened. So as we read this today, we're going to look at it twofold. One, we're going to look at John proving that Jesus is God. There'll be those that want to knock on your door of a certain cultish background. We pray for them, of course, right? They're sincere. They're just sincerely wrong. But they want to begin to have discussions with you, and they say, hey, can we have a couple of minutes of your time? And then right away from the gate, boom, Jesus is not God, right? You know he's not God. You know it doesn't say in the Bible that he is God. Let me tell you, all through the Bible, it screams so loudly that Jesus is God that even when Jehovah's Witnesses take their own translation where all of the blatant references as they feel in the New Testament about Jesus being God have been removed. You should do your own study. You can still use their own twisted translation to show that Jesus is God. The whole scripture makes clear Jesus is God. The whole New Testament makes clear that Jesus is God. So let's start reading. And as we read this, we're not only going to see that Jesus is God, but we're going to do some deep searching today. And what I want to give as a title is this. What do you do when the wine runs out? What do you do when the wine runs out? Right? Because look, we could just get into this and do our theological calisthenics. Calisthenics are good. We could use this today to just really just, just, you know, build up just our theology on Christ as God. And you guys just have more verses to be able to share that Christ is God because we're called to share the truth, right? But the Lord wants us to know that and it be a function of what we do with that reality. It's one thing to say Jesus is God. To even know that Jesus has saved you from the hell you deserve, and that when you breathe your last breath, Jesus will take you to the heaven you could never climb to on your own. But what about in the here and now? If Jesus is God, what does it mean for my Sunday today? If Jesus is God, and he is who he says he is, and all scripture is true, what does it mean for my tomorrow? What does it mean for my emotional state? What does it mean for my deepest needs? If Jesus is God, 
and me being acquainted with all my needs, and then the needs that I know I have that I can't even put my finger on, what does it mean if Jesus is God? And isn't that what real Bible study is all about? Closing the gap between what we know and what we do with what we know. Yeah? Why is the church so caught up in a tailspin and just seemingly so impotent because the church has given up that battle of trying to close the gap between what they know and what they do with what they know? See, what happens? You got a lot of tadpole Christians. You ever see a tadpole? Y'all, you never seen a tadpole? Come on, y'all, I need y'all today. A tadpole, right? What is it mostly? Torso? Right? What is it? Like a frog? You know, the, no, no, no. It is all head. And what about the body? Nobody. And that's what you see a lot in the church today. Tadpole Christians. All head, nobody. Know so much, can quote so much, but what they do with it, how it plays out, no action. We have got to come back to making every Bible study, every time in the Word, a time where we are seeking to close the gap with what we know and what we do with what we know. So again, if Jesus is God, if heaven is open, if the ladder is right here before me, and Jacob proves that that ladder of grace is there at the, for the worst parts of who we are. Again, Jacob didn't have that dream of the ladder once he apologized to his dad. He didn't have the dream of the ladder once he went back home. I've blasphemed God. You know, no, no, no. It was when he was still at his absolute worst. That, so now we know the ladder is here. The connection, the power of eternity, right, is here open for me. Angels ascending and descending to take care of me, to have my back. I slept with the lights on until I was 18 years old. I mean, people robbed my house a lot, so I had reason to. Scared of the dark, it'll mess you up when people rob your house when you're home when you're a little kid. I digress. But my point is security, feeling secure, feeling like someone has your back. Wow, now I can't even read that. Angels ascending and descending, ministering spirits to have my back, to take care of me when things go bump in the night. Do y'all ever just picture what the Bible teaches about angels? And knowing that angels have you, sent by God, directed by Jesus, ministering spirits to serve you. And man, one day we're going to get to see them. Maybe you feel like your angels are just going to be burnt out. <laughs> burnt out, stressed out, just like <laughs> praising the Lord. Hey, yo, who's that angel over there? I mean, that angel is really praising God. Oh, well, that's the angel that had to watch you, you know, all your life. And <laughs> angels, you know, already, and that angel's retired now, you know. The bottom line is, look, y'all, it's good to have fun with, but this is real. But again, we got to close the gap with what you know and what you do with what you know. Otherwise, it just stays up here and it just starts feeling like something akin to a Disney movie. Your mind starts doing weird things with it. Not because the Bible's weird, because we're weird. You understand? So let's look at this now. And again, what do you do when the wine runs out? What do you do when the wine runs out? Let's read so it says, the third day, interesting that the Lord wants us to know it was the third day. That's the number of resurrection, all of our sin debt, everything paid. The third day, the resurrection is how we know that Jesus' death was enough for people like us to have a clean slate with God and to have the ladder and the angels in descending at our disposal. He paid the price for all of that. So his first miracle, it's the third day. The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Would you just write backwoods? Would you write rural? I was just in Cana two months ago. Um, yeah, still the same backwoods as it was before. You know, it's a city. Um, but it, I mean, when I say city, it's, it's, it's a small city. But back in this day, it was just backwoods. Now it's a small city surrounded by backwoods, you know. So he is in a small town, Cana of Galilee, it says there's a wedding there, and it says the mother of Jesus was there. So here's a wedding. The mother of Jesus is there, verse 2, and Jesus was invited as well, and his disciples were invited to the marriage. So interesting to see, Jesus was not a hermit, a recluse. Jesus went to weddings. Jesus went to dinner parties, right? And it says that when he's there, verse 3, they wanted wine. That's what it says in the King James. It says, 
and when they wanted wine. In King James English, wanting means lacking. It means the wine was lacking. The wine was now lacking. What it means is they ran out of wine. And if you have maybe the NIV or another translation, it just says plain and clear. They ran out of wine. So Jesus and the disciples and his mother Mary are at a small wedding, a small wedding in Cana of Galilee. This is a small town. It would have been a small wedding. It's a small rural wedding. He's there. And what happens? They run out of wine. So the mother of Jesus says to him, they have no wine. So he's done no miracles yet, right? It's not like he just healed a leper yesterday, so therefore his mother runs up and says, oh, they ran out of wine. But what did she see? She didn't see him perform a miracle yet because the Bible makes clear this was his first miracle in his public ministry. What did she see, though, if she didn't see him perform a miracle? She saw the Holy Spirit fill her with child in her womb when she was a virgin. She saw the heavens opened and come down upon Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove. She knew who he was. So look at what she's doing when the wine runs out. And I'm going to keep asking the question today. What do you do when the wine runs out? What do you do when the wine runs out? Matter of fact, maybe it would help if I paused right now and just helped you make some correlation with symbolism, lest anyone right here is like, you know, so what's he telling me? Like, you know, if the wine runs out, you know, if the, you know, Prosecco runs out, you know, what do I do? And wine in the Bible, do you know what wine represents in the Bible? Wine represents joy. Did you know that? You know, water represents the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Oil represents the Holy Spirit, right? Soil represents the human heart. Leaven represents sin, right? There's something called seed represents the word of God because it goes into the soil of the heart and grows. You have symbols in the Bible. Silver represents redemption. Gold represents deity. The acacia tree represents humanity. There's all these symbols. In the Bible, wine is a symbol of joy, It says in Psalm 4, verse 7, Lord, you've put gladness in my heart more than the time when even the corn and the wine increase. See, it's saying, Lord, when the wine increases, oh, I have joy, but you give me even greater joy than harvest and when the the wine is all being bottled, when it's time, when it's actually been time ripened and time to share. It says in Psalms 104, verse 15, God gave wine to make man's heart glad. Now, we must share real quick that the same Bible that says that wine is a symbol of joy, the same Bible that even says that God gave wine as a gift to man as to make his heart merry is the same Bible that condemns drunkenness, is the same Bible that gives warnings in Proverbs 23 of how you need to watch the glass. It even says, watch the way the wine swirls in the glass because it'll bite you like a snake. Then it'll laugh at you. Like once you're acting a monkey or whatever, you're all twisted. It says the wine is actually laughing at you. So it's just like when you give your your kids a car. You're like, hey, let me tell you about this car. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you can put your favorite song on. And then you just cruise. And then you got your favorite coffee and you just cruise. And you're going to get somewhere a lot faster than your skateboard. But this thing is also a weapon. You be careful. This thing can can kill somebody. You know what I mean? This thing can take, take someone's life. This thing can kill you. And other people are driving around enjoying this privilege, but their weapon will kill you. So you teach both. We have to just teach both. That's it. But wine is a symbol of joy. So when I'm saying that now Jesus, he's chosen his first miracle is turning water into wine. Wine in the Bible is a symbol of joy. Wine, there's a crisis here because wine runs out. The question to you today is what do you do when the wine runs out? So what do you do when the joy runs out of your Christian walk? What do you do when the peace runs out? You can remember when you had the peace of God and you just had a, you could just hear Jesus, Jesus, take the wheel. And man, it's like your whole soul transformed. But now you say, Jesus, take the wheel. And it's, it's like, I don't, you don't even know, like, well, all right, it's up here, but I'm still revved up. Matter of fact, I'm feeling just as revved up as an atheist right now, but I'm supposed to have peace. The peace has run out. 
What about when the hope is run out? You had a hope for your family, a hope of how things would be, you know, uh, a hope to see some change. And, and that hope is, it's lingered. That change has not come yet. Hope's run out. What about perspective? You used to get it. You got what it was about. You got what church was about. You got with why we come together, what the huddle's about, and what our mission is in the world. And it seems like now, you know, you just, you're not able to connect the dots. It's like a little kid with the coloring book. You're like going from, instead of to make a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you go from one to two to three to four, and it starts looking more and more like a dinosaur. All of a sudden now you're going from like one to 84, 84 to 62. You don't even know how to connect the dots no more. What do you do when the perspective runs out? So here, Jesus is at a wedding. The wine runs out. The source, the symbol, what represents joy and gladness, it's run out. Mary, believing who he is, it's all about trust. Mary, trusting him, runs to him. The question to you is, what do you do? What have you been doing when the wine's run out? But first, you have to take inventory on what's run out in your life. Where do you feel dry? Where are you dry? And chances are you tend to know you're dry because it's the area where at one time you weren't dry. You notice that something's not right because you can reflect at a time when it was right. You follow what I'm saying? What do you do when the wine runs out? And as I said, there's so many believers just have the knowledge up here but don't want to put in any work. Oh, they want to put in work to make sure their phone has all the latest apps. They want to put in work to make sure that they find the best restaurant in the city they've not eaten at yet. They put in work at the gym, but they don't put in any work when it comes to thinking on the things of God and the matters of the soul. And maybe there are many that have run out and you haven't been doing anything about it. Well, can I come with good news today? The good news is here you're here to remember all over again who Jesus is and his heart toward you. And today, let's have some wine return in your life. It's time for you to believe. And we're going to follow the simple steps of how the wine came back. And guess what? It wasn't even a work where, oh, the whole team had to work so hard. And then Jesus reluctantly made water in the wine. You're going to see Jesus today who is waiting and who does it because he's full of grace and truth. And is it a wedding? It's not even like he's in a triage unit. It's not like he's at a place where it's life or death. You know, no, it's a wedding. It's a wedding. It's a, it's a party. It is at a party. But yet because he's full of grace and truth, even at the party, he can be approached when the wine runs out. Wow. Doesn't it help now understanding what wine represents? Are you beginning to see that, wow, this is deeper than I thought of why Jesus' first miracle would be turning water into wine? Could have turned water into grapefruit juice. But it's wine that's the symbol of joy. We live in a world that taxes us, that takes from us. Our own rebellious flesh tag teams with this world that taxes us. Now we're actually taxing ourselves in the name of self-help. We're actually, how many of y'all have learned, sometimes you try to help yourself, follow non-biblical recipes, and in the name of trying to help yourself, you're making yourself worse. Do you realize we, we, we mess up everything we touch? You, you, you realize that after a while. You, you heard what I said. You've now decided that you're going to fix yourself. You're going to work on you. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna relax more. And wow, your little plan has actually driven you further from God. It might look like what everyone else is doing, but it's done nothing for your relationship with God. In fact, it's made it worse because now you got 50 more things that you do instead of reading your Bible. Before you made your plan, you just had two things you did before reading your Bible. Today, he wants to bring the wine back. The wine is run out. Something in your spiritual walk is run out. And the good, beautiful, wonderful Jesus. But you got you to believe who he is. And you got to go to him. So we're going to be doing inventory on where have you been going instead? You know, it says in Jeremiah chapter 2, I'm going to read it. You don't have to turn there. But in Jeremiah, the prophet said this to God's people. He says, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And instead, they've chosen broken pottery that can't even hold stagnant water. 
They've forsaken me, the source of all joy, the source of all strength, the source of all perspective, the source of all light, all clarity, all power. And instead of wanting the living supernatural waters, Jeremiah 2.13, they're choosing the broken pottery and the stagnant waters of the world that can hold no water. Wow. So they run out of wine, John chapter 2. Now we're going to take the treadmill and we're going to turn it up to like a 6.5, right? Now jog, now a faster jog. So Mary goes to him in verse 3 and she says, Jesus, they have no wine. He's just a guest at the wedding. They run out of wine, but she knows who he is. She knows his heart. She trusts him. She says, Jesus, they have no wine. Verse 4, Jesus says unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. Now, some read this and say, oh, wow, like Jesus just kind of, what a sharp rebuke to Mary. One, we have to make sure that when we read the Bible, we're not reading it with our cultural uh, way of doing things today. Today, when we call a woman, woman, yeah, yeah, you, you, every right to get checked. But that's not the way it was used then. And you can tell because in John 19, verse 26, when Jesus is hanging from the cross, he says, woman, behold your son. So obviously, woman is used in a very different way and even a tender way. In John chapter 4, verse 21, when speaking to the Samaritan woman who had five different husbands, he says to her, woman. So obviously, it can be used in a tender way. So he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. If you recall when Jesus was only eight days old and Anna and Simeon, the prophetess, had talked about what he would go through to bring and redeem Israel, Mary heard all of that. Jesus is saying to her, my hour hasn't come yet. Meaning, when he says my hour, all throughout the gospels, you'll see it say, they went to grab Jesus and throw him off a cliff but his hour had not come yet, so he, he would not die, right? And he's saying, my hour, my time to redeem human history, my time to die and provide the fountain of cleansing for all, right? Because the problem here that you need, where you need my supernatural power, I came for one purpose. I came to bring life where there's death. I came to bring forgiveness where there is condemnation. I came to bring light where there's darkness, and that will all happen on the cross. He would refer to it as an hour. Yes, he hung on the cross for roughly six hours, but he would say, my hour has not come yet. My hour has not come yet. You can write down John 7, verse 30. It says that it wasn't yet his hour. John chapter 8, verse 20, it wasn't yet his hour. No man could lay hold of him because it wasn't yet his hour. But then in John chapter 12, on the week of the Passion Week when he's going to be crucified, he then says, the hour is now come upon us. John 13, verse 1, it says at the Last Supper table, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, he gets up and begins to wash their feet. John 17, 1, the prayer before he is arrested. He says, the hour is now here. So his mind is on why he came here, right? Let's just jump in at verse four. Do you have that burden? Christ came down for one purpose and it would all culminate in his work on the cross, which he referred to as his hour. Every believer, I believe, we have a course it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts to bless you, not to curse you, to give you an expected end. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, before he's going to be beheaded, I finished my course. I fought a good fight. I ran the race. I finished my course. We all have a course. We all have a course. We all have our hour. It says in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, that when the Messiah would come, he would set his face like a flint. A flint is basically what you use to start a fire. It's because it can't be broken. It's referred to as like a, a hard, fast will that can't be swayed. That was Jesus' face heading to Jerusalem. All three and a half years of his public ministry, he had his face on why he was here. Can I ask you a question? Are you concerned with fulfilling why you're here? 
Paul writes to the Colossians, and the very last verses of Colossians, he addresses a man named Archippus, and he says this, tell Archippus, Colossians 4, 17, tell Archippus, take heed to the ministry that you've received from the Lord and make sure you fulfill it. Every one of us has a ministry. Every one of us has been put here and been given gifts, and God has anointed us for a ministry. And just as Jesus had his hour on his mind, is your ministry on your mind or just bills? And who likes you and who doesn't like you? And what to wear and what to eat? What did Jesus say? The Gentiles, the the pagans worry about that stuff. Didn't he tell us that directly in the Sermon on the Mount? Life is not just about who likes you, who doesn't like you, what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat. But how much has the church just fallen into that? And church is a place where you just stop in and get some head knowledge. And then we go off and into tadpole Christian culture. But we all have a ministry. And we're supposed to be concerned that we miss it. Jesus even says to the church in Revelation, let no man take your crown. What does he mean by that in Revelation 3? You see, we're going to get crowns for our service, but it's saying that if you don't want the service he has for you, he'll give your ministry to someone else, and the crown you should have gotten, they get. Wow. We need to get back to wondering, what is my ministry? Let me be be real with y'all. Can I be real? How how real do you want me to be on a scale of 1 to 10? Oh, 10? There's some ministries I'm in, I'd have been left them. What? Man, listen, (laughs) you ask a pastor, you ask anyone involved in anything if they ever thought about quitting. What does your flesh do when the going gets tough? Your flesh like, oh, your flesh starts giving you ideas. You start driving in, you just see, you know, sanitation workers just throwing garbage bags. You're going to deal with tough ministry. And don't get me wrong, sanitation work. I was a janitor in New York City for five years when I was in college. Oh, it can be grimy and it's hard work. But see, garbage don't talk back. Garbage don't kick you. Garbage don't just, you know, garbage just, it just sits there. So sometimes you're driving in for ministry and you drive and you could be in a tough season. And man, you're just looking at, you're jealous. And guess who you're jealous of? The person on the pole just splicing wires for the phone company. The person, you know, just throwing garbage bags in the back of the truck. And you're just like, oh, man, I, I trade jobs with you right now. And you just picture hanging on the back of the truck. And, whoo, I just, you know, Gatorade in one hand and just went and Don't get me wrong. Hard work. I've done that, right? But my point is, why am I still here today? And some of my toughest seasons of ministry, I've been doing this over 20 years. It's tough seasons. Why? Because at the final analysis, the word of God won over my thoughts and emotions. I have a ministry and I'm concerned with not fulfilling it. Just as Jesus came down and his hour is on his mind, why he came down, I realize I'm not just here because my mom and dad had a crush on each other. I'm not just here, you know, to do me. God put me here, chose the family I'd be in, permitted what I went through all of my life, whether it's this, that, single home, two parents, having stuff, not having stuff, struggling, struggling hard, all shaping me for a moment in time of ministry. And you spend the rest of your Christian ministry realizing how every detail of your life shaped you for that moment and you comfort others. 2 Corinthians 1, 4, with the comfort you've received from God. We all have a ministry, and we need to be concerned about not fulfilling it. But we live in a day where quitter culture has invaded the church. You look at somebody wrong, they quit. Oh, who are you looking at? Oh, you know, or you don't look at them. Hey, you didn't look at me. I quit. <laughs> yeah, you saw, but that's the day we're in. You ain't texting me back. I quit. Our our Savior didn't know any of that language. All he knew was his hour. And his hour would entail something that even if we lived a million lifetimes, and it was a million lifetimes of unspeakable suffering, it would never just be a drop in a bucket of what his hour was as he tasted death for every man and became a curse for us and took the wrath of God. 
his hour, his hour. And not only that, but he was joyful about his hour. The complaining spirit in the church today is not the spirit of Jesus. His hour was on his mind, but it was an hour. It was never with complaint. It was focused. See, that's its own message. Let's get back to wondering, Lord, what's my hour? What's my moment? I might miss something. Let me check in with you before I check out. Let me check in with you before I go away. Let me check in with you before I just decide not to show up at that place where people are used to seeing me. I might miss something. I might miss my hour. And then the Lord says, to whom much is given, you know, you given more. You know, him that hath, more shall be given. As the Lord sees you're faithful in that hour, boom, now he's entrusting you with greater hours. You see, some people, you, man, you want, you don't want, well, God ain't doing nothing for me. Yeah, because every time you, you're, you don't be caring about your hour. You don't care. All you care is that your bunions hurt. And you convince yourself, I'll be fresher for next time. There might not be a next time in that way for ministry in this day, in these last days, where the stakes are high. It will be for someone else, but not if you don't want it. But we got to, why are we here? Why are we here? I have a daughter. She's an industrial engineer at Merck Pharmaceuticals. Worked so hard. I'm so proud of her. But I tell my daughter all the time, princess, The world don't need any more beautiful, smart women doing their thing. It's a lot of them in the world. But what the world does need is a beautiful, smart woman doing her thing that is looking to shine and just be where Jesus wants her to be, reflecting his light. My son, astro and aero engineer at Purdue University, interns with a global space software company, one of the more known companies in the world. I tell my son, the world don't need any more smart, energetic go-getters. It's a lot of them out there. But what the world does need is smart, energetic go-getters that are concerned about knowing they're there for a reason and doing their thing day to day, but just concerned about, Jesus, am I where you want me to be? They're our. We have to be concerned about our hour. Too many believers don't care nothing about their hour. All they want is the blessings from Jesus, but they don't care whether Jesus is walking with them or not. And all of our hearts are just as wicked. We got to talk this kind of tough talk. Oh, I'm I'm talking to me too, by the way, y'all, you know? It's tough. You ain't know you got to have real tough talk. You don't have this kind of tough talk with yourself. I think that's what, and, and it's a difference. This isn't a condemning talk. I'm not stomping on myself, am I? No, I'm moving myself by the love and the goodness of Jesus to be drawn to this beauty to where you're like, oh my gosh, how can I not? There's a difference. So if don't, don't walk away today and you're in the car just beating your head on the steering wheel. Well, well, Pastor Aaron said we got to talk tough. No, no, no. Jesus is full of grace and truth, y'all. <laughs> it's his love that conquers us. It's his love that transforms us. It's his love that made John into this person. But it's because of that love that we have to be radical and even radical with how we get down to business with the conversations we need to have with our own heart. So, look, verse 4, and i got to wrap this up. I'm running out of time. But look, verse 4 is very mysterious because she comes and says there's no wine. He says, woman, my hour hasn't come yet. Right? Follow me, y'all. And then she says in verse 5, she looks at the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. It leads you to believe that perhaps, even though all we read is, woman, it's not my hour yet, but yet she turns and says to the servants, do what he says. There's obviously something in his body language. He's getting up. He's rolling up his sleeves. He gives her the answer, hey, it's not my hour yet. The reason of why I've really come, the the cross, what it's all about, has not come yet, but I'm about to do this. Something and where she says, whatever he does, do it. Now, look at this. Verse 6. There were there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. They all had two or three firkins apiece. Write in your notes. That's 20 to 30 gallon containers. So there's six containers of stone. Yes. Each is 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus is about to turn 150 gallons. Six times 20 is 120. Six times 30 is 180. A firkin is 20 to 30 gallons. Let's say 150. It's right in the middle, right? He's about to turn 150 gallons 
of wine, of water into wine. Now, God turns water into wine all the time. He just does it through a long process. Clouds, rain, grapes grow, fermentation. That's water. Clouds down, turns water into wine all the time. He's just now about to do it like this. How many of y'all, is there something in your life where just because depression tends to go away over a year, just because, you know, well, things and relationships don't just get repaired overnight, it, that just because things tend to take a long time, you're forgetting that Jesus can make anything happen, even though there tends to be a long road with some things, he is the Lord that can take any of those things and make it happen right now if he chooses. And we could come into church, well, I'm going to get enlightened today, but even if I do, you know, anxiety doesn't just go away. It didn't just come overnight, and it doesn't just go overnight. And then you could point at other, I know this person it took this long, I know this person it took this long, I know this. No, no, but he is still the Lord, because he turns water into wine all the time. But right now, he's going to do it just like this, and when the wine runs out, what makes this thing so exciting is you never know what Jesus is going to do. He's so good, you never know how he's going to flex. But we start telling him what he's going to do. Well, I know you're not going to heal me of this depression today. I know, you know, this stuff runs in my family. I'm a fourth generation. This, that. You're not going to, come on, it's generational. Now. now, here you are. The wines run out, and you know the wines run out in an area. But here you are in your prayer telling Jesus already what the conditions are going to be. As opposed to what Mary says. Whatever he says, do, do it. And what does he tell us to do? What does he, because look what she says. She says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. He then says to them in verse 7, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now, carry it to the governor of the feast. And they carried it. And when the ruler of the feast, verse 9, tasted the water that was now made wine and knew not how it happened, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom of the wedding and said, wait a minute, most people put out the good wine at the beginning, and then when people have become a little pickled and their taste buds have become a little numb, paraphrase, then they put out what's worse, but you are different. This is towards the end of the wedding, and now you're pulling out the best stuff. One, it shows you that the Lord, not only is he in our life, not only is Jacob's ladder in heaven open in our life, but the best is yet to come. His whole modus operandi is better. His whole modus operandi is better. It's better. This doesn't wane out. This doesn't wear out. It gets better. It, it's because the Bible teaches it is why I teach it. But look at what she says. Whatever he says to do, do it. So, what do you do? Well, you should already have a working list of what's run out. And look, as long, just like sure enough, every few days in my Jeep, gas runs out. I don't get tired of the monotony. <laughs> I don't start saying, oh my gosh, this is such a pattern. I go get gas. That's it. We are going to run out. The, the joy will run out. The joy of Bible reading will run out. The, the, the desire to raise your hands when you worship will run out. Now all of a sudden your hand's in your pocket. Now you don't even come to worship no more. It runs out. It's just what do you do when it runs out? Mary said, one, she believed who he was. Two, she says, whatever he says, do it. Right? You following me? What does he tell us to do? Because, right, see, we're, you know, we're in America, we're all about work, assembly line. So what do we do? What do we do? All right, what do we do? I want, all right, the wine's run out. I know I need more peace. I know I need more joy. I know I need this back and this back and this back, right? What do I do? Go to John chapter 6. Then I promise I'm done. Let's have the worship team come up. John chapter 6, verse 28. Ready? Because, right? As Americans, right away, we're expecting a laundry list of things to do. How to get six-pack abs for Jesus, right? Give me the list. And look, look at this, John 6, 28. They said to him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Look at what Jesus says. Here's the work. Believe on him whom he has sent. What? So what do I do when the oil runs out? Yo, I just believe, believe on him. 
do, that's why we come to church. That's why we read the word, because we got to believe on the one whose name we say, right? And would you look at this? Look at verse 11, then I promise I'm done. But you got to go to John 2, 11. This is the beginning of miracles Jesus did. The Bible just told you it's his first miracle. And then it says this, and it manifested his glory. And wait, 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 listen, y'all. And then I'm done. But you got to listen to this. It says, Josh, you ready? It says, and his disciples believed on him. Underline that. Wait a minute. (laughs) I just read a chapter ago that they already believed on him, y'all. I just read a chapter ago that Nathaniel said, my Lord and my God. What does it mean telling me that they believed on him now when I just saw them believe on him yesterday? Do you get that's what the Christian life is about? They already believed. It means they already trusted him. But after more and more of his goodness, they believed on They allowed themselves to trust him more. That's the work, y'all. Some of y'all might not be allowing yourself to trust him more. Because you're so busy telling Jesus who you think he is and <clears throat> how it works. And, oh, I know my Bible. So you don't look nothing up because you already know everything. You could be getting in the way of allowing yourself to believe on him more. So yes, John 2, 11 says they believed on him. Yes, it's the same people that believed on him a chapter ago. Believed on means trust in. They trusted in him more. The more we learn, you see right now, y'all, check it out. If you've let this message do its thing, you believe on him more than you did yesterday, right now. You, you're trusting him. You're allowing, you're in awe right now. You're allowing yourself to trust him more than you did 51 minutes ago when we started. You heard? You follow what I'm saying? Sorry, I'm done. Okay, Father, we just thank you so much for meeting us today and loving us today. Jesus, we want the wine to come back. We, we've run out of wine and we're coming to you. We repent of all the wrong places we go, looking for love in the wrong places, looking for peace in the wrong places, looking for relaxation in the wrong places. Your word says that you lead us beside green pastures and still waters. We repent of choosing cheap, lying substitutes when the wine has run out. But we're here now and asking you for the joy, for the peace, for the perspective, for the hope, for the passion again, Lord. Thank you for being our endless supply. Thank you for turning water into wine. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, we do pray that you would even receive this offering today as worship of all you've given to us. We can financially give to you. May it be used to share your love with the world, this love with a world that needs it so desperately. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can give through the Cash App as well.